Uh, good morning. Very, very excited to be here. Uh, this, I think, is probably the largest crowd that I've spoken to before. And it's kind of interesting to see how I, well, I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for going out and learning and practicing street epistemology. And I think one of the reasons why I'm up here is because this approach has really sparked an interest. I'm just a regular guy who decided to go out and just have conversations with people. And I think it's gotten a lot of attention from folks and I'm very excited to share it with you. I think this actually could be a turning point for atheism. I forgot that I have slides. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, and I think street epistemology is going to be critical to the success of atheism, which is why I'm very excited to tell you about it. We're going to get really into my journey and, and this method. Next slide here. Okay. I also want to talk a little bit about truth. I want to kind of take a step back a little bit. Um, when we have conversations with people, usually we're interested in changing their mind or helping them to believe true things. And usually we want to believe true things as well. So we engage in debate or dialogue or conversation with them. But we have to remind ourselves that we ourselves are just as capable of believing things that are not true. It's entirely possible that a lot of the things that I believe are not true. So what is the best way to determine what is true? What is the best way to determine what is not true? These are questions that have troubled humanity from the beginning. But as atheists, I think we try to accomplish this question about God when we engage in debate with people. We, we tend to argue with them or discuss the finer points of the Bible, for example. Um, and it's oftentimes hard to get into the mindset of a believer unless you discuss what that person believes. We tend to focus a lot about that. We tend to focus a lot about what the person believes as opposed to their reasons or their method. And I think it's really important that as atheists, we need to find a better way of figuring out what is true and helping people figure out what's true. And again, that's why I'm so excited to be here to tell you about this method, because I think this might be the thing that helps atheists have better conversations with the believers who are making these claims. Okay. I brought along... Oh, did I kick out? Bruce, can you... Maximize that? Okay. That may have been my fault. Okay, so I brought along a couple of video clips here. So just a, just a little warning. Uh, the first video clip I want to show you, this is about two minutes long. I've got five video clips total. But I want to kind of show you how I used to go out and have talks with believers. Uh, this is a street preacher here in front of the Alamo. And this was back in 2012. This is about two minutes long. Uh, he does talk about hell during this video. So fair warning, if that troubles you, you just you might be, want to be aware of that. Uh, Oh, there, there are some people that are really troubled by it, and that's fine. Uh, so just fair warning. Um, and this is not an example of street epistemology. Don't watch this video, walk out, and think, oh, that's what street epistemology is. And uh, the other takeaway I wanted to let you know is that I'm not really proud of this exchange. <laughs> so here we go, street preacher Phil. Volume. God is doing it. You said that already. We have the Word of God. It's in the King James Bible. It's not the Book of Mormon. It's not the Kabbalah. It's not the, the, the Babylonian Talmud. There's it's just in as, the Word of God, the King James Bible. There's just as much evidence for those gods than your, there is your God. Not really. Yes, there is. Not really. There's z zero evidence. The scripture says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's what it says, sinners, but why should we believe it? Today? Why should we believe are that? Are you saved? Not are you a Mormon or a Baptist or a Catholic or a Methodist, but are you saved? The Bible says we must be saved. Jesus saved me in 1987 in the month of December, and I'm not going back to what I was. I'm no better than anybody else. But my friends, as a street preacher, I gotta warn you: there is a hell, and you're going there. There's, and you will not repent. There's absolutely no. There's absolutely no evidence for a hell or a heaven. 
or a purgatory. There's no evidence for that at all. You'll find out. There'll be plenty of evidence. How could you believe in something now without even knowing because that it's true? The guy in, in the book of you Luke point to 16, you point to the Bible again. He went to hell. There's no evidence that the Bible's true. You don't believe it, dude. Of course I don't. I'm not convinced that it is true. Well, that's all you, right. You're I'm making not condemning you because you don't, man. You, you're making the claim. You need to prove to me that it's I true. I don't have to prove you anything. Yes, you do. No, you can't stand out here and make claims as if it's a fact. I, right here, man. And that's scare my fact. these people and young kids. Hey, listen. What's to wrong it. with you? <laughs> I was kind of hoping that would not draw an applause line. <laughs> you know, at the time, it felt good to humiliate him. It really did. He was saying this nonsense and, and just yelling things. And I, didn't, I wasn't aware that there is a potentially better way to interact with believers. So I was arguing with him. I was just doing what just seemed natural to point him to evidence, to, to challenge what he was saying. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time that it probably didn't make me as an atheist look very good standing out there. Um, as I watched this even, I noticed that he explains why he believes that it was true. He had a difficulty uh, way back when, he gave an exact date. There was some momentous occasion and he didn't want to go back to that time. He didn't want to go back to that time where he was hurting. So there's the motivation behind his belief. But I, didn't, I couldn't even see it because I was so interested in, in arguing with him and tearing him down. However, that approach, I think, does have its place. If you look, there's people in the background watching. There's a young couple there. Behind the sign, there's a little kid. And you never know what that takeaway may have been. They may have been shocked to hear somebody f standing up to a believer making a claim. They may have gone home to figure out, is the Bible true? You never know how that may have landed with people observing. But let's think about Phil. Do you think that his mind was changed that day? It's, it's probably unlikely. More than likely, he went home, read his Bible, said a prayer, and was emboldened by that conversation. He's probably thinking that it's more true now than ever before because his belief stand, stood up to the scrutiny of somebody yelling at him. And just a little side note, um, I follow the street preacher community a little bit. They love it when people argue with them. They love getting crowds. One of the worst things I think you could do is argue with a street preacher and draw a crowd because they see that as a, as a success. So please try to avoid doing that if you can. Um, now, I wasn't that aggressive with my family members, okay? Oh, that, there was a brother-in-law maybe that was a little bit like that. <laughs> but I'd laugh at them and I'd spend hours digging up facts to show that they were mistaken. And I jeopardized those relationships and I'm still trying to rebuild them even though my style has changed completely from that. Uh, I'm still trying to repair those relationships. And that's what, kind of one of the reasons why I'm so eager to be talking to you today because I suspect that many people have damaged relationships with their loved ones and, and friends and coworkers and so forth. And I'm really excited to be, to be able to tell you about this, this approach. So let's talk a little bit about street epistemology here. Okay. Um, I think street epistemology might be the best approach for having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about their deeply held belief. I understand that that's a bold claim, but I've been doing this for five years and I've had profound one-on-one -on -one conversations, and sometimes two-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'll talk to a Mormon couple and we've talked for 30 minutes and it was one of the best conversations that I think I've ever had. So, um, so before I can explain why I think street epistemology is going to be fundamental to the success of atheism, that it's a turning point, I need to explain to you what street epistemology is. So the street part of it simply means layman engagement. You're, you're having a conversation with somebody. You're not necessarily an expert in the Quran or the Bible or what the claim is, but you can engage with them. Um, it's actually one of the strengths of this method, I think, is that you don't really have to be well-versed in the doctrine to have these dialogues. In fact, I think the less you know about the claim, the better questions you'll form when you have these conversations. So the epistemology part is the study of knowledge. It's how a person determined that their belief is true. When you hear the word epistemology, my recommendation would be just think of the word method. Think of technique, think of approach, something like that. I like to think of SE as a tool that we can use 
to challenge people respectfully. And this isn't my creation. I didn't come up with this. Uh, this came from a book called A Manual for Creating Atheists by Dr. Peter Bogosian. And um, it's based on the Socratic method. I read the book. I started looking for examples online, and there were no examples at all. And I, was, and I would go out. I think this, I was kind of going out to try to do street epistemology. There was one good why question in there when I was yelling at that preacher. Why do you think that it's true? But there was no rapport building. There was, the tone was horrible. And I certainly wasn't trying to understand his methodology. So I've been going out and trying to sort of perfect or hone this method for like the last five years. Here's a definition of it. A um, couple points of here. Um, street epistemology is a conversational tool. It's not a debate. It's a polite discussion. And it is a tool. It's something that you can use uh, if the situation is appropriate, depending on your goals. And the conversations tend to help people reflect or think about their belief long after the conversation ends. When I have a dialogue with somebody, if they think about it then and there but never think about it again, then that's really not much of a success to me. I want these, th these conversations to resonate with folks. Um, and then we challenge the method that they use. Did they use a reliable method to come to that conclusion? All right. So one of the things I think I need to kind of get out of the way really quick are some misconceptions of this because the word street is in there and a lot of the examples are people going out with video cameras and uploading their conversations and they're like, oh, you're just like proselytizing for atheism or this is like Ray Comfort or something. Um, there are no bananas in street epistemology. <laughs> have you know. um, street epistemology honestly is about helping people. It's helping people slow down and think about the belief that they formed and did they use a reliable method. And it's not just about God claims. It could be about anything. Some of my best conversations have been with atheists who are dogmatically sure there are no gods. SE is really good about encouraging people to be less dogmatic about the beliefs that they formed. And we try to uncover truth. Now, these conversations can be initiated or organic. Uh, my preference is to have an organic chat. Like when I get in an Uber, I almost always have a chat with the driver about something. They make a claim and it's game on. I can start asking questions. And we usually end it on good terms and they usually give me a five star rating. So I think that's okay. And I do the same for them. So I can understand how people might make the connection that this is like atheist evangelizing or something. Um, and I'm here giving a talk on street epistemology to American atheists. So I can understand how you, how you can make that connection. But this is a tool that can be used for all different types of claims. All right? It doesn't just have to be about challenging people about God. And this is so much about placing a pebble in a person's shoe, helping a person reflect on their belief formation process later when the conversation's over. And they can ask themselves, do I need to maintain this belief? Do I need to lower my confidence in this belief? Should I discard this belief outright? So I wanted to put street epistemology in graphical form. Now I've had hundreds of conversations, thousands of conver a thousand conversations at least, started looking at transcripts and I started noticing a little pattern that we spend a little bit of time talking about what they believe, a little bit more time talking about why they believe it, but we spend a lot more time talking about how they determine that that belief is true. And that I think is what makes these conversations unique and Socratic and street epistemology is that we're interested in their methodology. Here's a different way of looking at it. Same pyramid, but different words. So we're interested in what they believe. We want to understand their reasons, their main reason, but it's the methodology that they used. So when you think of street epistemology, think method. We're very, very interested in the method. Because if the method is faulty, all the other things above it collapse. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that what they're believing is not true. If they've based it on a, I could base something on faith, I can realize it's a faulty methodology, and what I'm believing could actually still be true. I get that. But one's confidence should probably be adjusted accordingly if they learned that their method was unreliable. Okay, a couple of video examples here. 
I want to talk to that actually. So um, I was also thinking like these little, these little sections here, when we talk about what a person believes, that's usually what the preacher tells you in church. This is what the Bible says. This is what we believe. When you get to the apologists, the people that defend, there was a guy that asked a question who said he was an apologist. These are folks that defend the faith. They come up with, with reasons to justify the belief. Okay, so there's this reason level. But very few people are looking at their foundation. And that's why these questions, I think, are powerful. Because we're not concerned with what you believe. We're not really concerned with why. But how did you determine that it's true? And the apologists are taken aback by this. I'll get into this a little bit later. Um, they're a little worried about this. Okay. Um, when I first started doing this, there were no video examples. Today, there are hundreds. And some of my favorites are not even mine. Uh, it's really neat to see other people going out, people in France and England. Um, Finland, for example, are going out and having wonderful talks all across the United States. And it's, this is probably an understatement, but street epistemology did not come naturally to me. I was kind of like arguing with street preacher Phil there for a good year and a half. I was, but I was getting out of it. I was, it was, it was evolving. But uploading these videos, as horrible as they were, I was getting feedback from folks saying, hey, that's not, is that really street epistemology? And shouldn't you be asking questions rather than telling them what to think? So it was changing the way that I was behaving. It was changing my interactions, and I think for the better. So I realized that it's kind of difficult to explain what street epistemology is. So I want to show you a couple of examples. I've got four little video clips, and they're super short. Um, this next one, this is a good one. So. <laughs> a couple of things here. I got to make sure not to laugh into the mic. So a couple of things here. Um, set aside your view on pornography, whether you think it's harmful or not. That's not the point of this little clip. The point is to demonstrate the mechanics of street epistemology. This also shows that you don't have to use street epistemology for just God claims. It's excellent for it. But in this case, the topic of pornography comes up here. And the other takeaway, I think, is Try to set, your, set aside your biases. When I'm having a dialogue with a person, my stance on pornography is not important at this point. I want to understand why he thinks that it's harmful, for example. So that's what this conversation is about. And take, pay really close attention to the real reason why he holds his view on pornography. It's just the, the uh, scientific evidence proves it's just like any kind of drug, you know, like oh. the first time you watch it, do you value scientific evidence? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if definitely. Denzel, if we can provide you, if I can provide you or somebody that follows us closely, yeah. if I discovered some scientific evidence that showed that everything that you've just described very eloquently, it doesn't work in that way. They've interviewed 10,000 porn stars and 100,000 men and women, okay. and the overall result suggests that it's a positive. All right? People feel better about themselves. They're living longer. Marriages are actually prospering. Crime is going down, like across the board. Okay. And I don't even know if that could even be measured. But if it could, okay. if there was a, a reliable study that showed something completely different than what you're outlining just now, would you change your mind on it? No, I wouldn't, because at the end of the day, I do value, I do value like you know, scientific evidence, historical evidence, and that, and that kind of stuff. But at the end, at the heart of it, like I'm a Christian, so I live like by a set of principles. Okay. That was Denzel. So we could have spent a lot of time wasted just discussing pornography because he admits there that it's not based on evidence. Even if he was shown evidence that it was not harmful, he'd still hold the belief. And that's what I love about this method is that it's efficient. You don't have to spend any time arguing about things that don't matter. If somebody raises contradictions in the Bible as their reason, but they'd still believe if every contradiction was adequately explained, don't discuss contradictions with them. Move on to the real reasons. Get to the core. Get to the lowest level. And that, I think, is what is great about street epistemology. If I were to meet with him again, I wouldn't discuss porn at all. I would talk about why he thinks his God is real. And what's really interesting is that once that God belief goes, 
and I'm sure many people here used to believe and don't. Once you lose that God belief, so many other things fall the wayside. So I love the efficiency of this approach. And you may have noticed that I didn't give him statistics to show how beneficial pornography was or anything like that. Um, it probably would have been, it more than likely would have, would have been a waste of time with this individual. In fact, there's this thing called the backfire effect. I don't know if I'm, show of hands, who's heard of this before? Lots of hands, good. Okay, so this is somewhat controversial. This is a hypothesis that suggests that if you provide people with evidence that shows that they're mistaken, especially on a belief that's very tied to who they are, they are less likely to accept your evidence and let it change their mind. Now, um, the backfire effect part of that is that some people even believe what they believe even more. There does seem to be some new research that suggests that people sometimes might accept your evidence, but their attitude doesn't change about the belief. Okay, so I think we're still good with the SE thing here. Um, and that's the beauty of this approach. We're not debating what they believe. We aren't dismissing their reasons. You don't need to know anything about their holy book or anything like that. You don't even have to provide evidence to a person when you have these talks. It kind of takes the pressure off. I'm a questioner. Help me understand. Teach me why you think that this is true. When you start looking at these conversations that way, I think it really, like I said, does take the pressure off. It makes these conversations so much easier. And somebody once described this approach as making people comfortably uncomfortable. You may have noticed the difference between the conversation with Denzel and the one with Phil, how drastically different one was. Um, I was asking him questions, I was, I was listening to him, and that type of thing. Okay, one more video clip. I've got about 15, 16 minutes, it looks like, left. This is Gordon. This is two and a half minutes long. He's elderly. Um, I picked this one because a lot of the early examples that I uploaded was me interviewing college-age students on campuses. And they're like, you're just picking on young, inexperienced people. So I'm like, I'm going to go talk to some older people. So for like the last two years, I've been on this hiking trail talking to people. And this is Gordon. Um, so there's, no real, there's really no age limit. But the, during this little talk, which is two and a half minutes long, the video will stop twice when he says something that I think would be raw meat to an atheist. Where you'd hear it and you're like, there's no way he's getting away with that. <laughs> so the video pauses at those moments and there's like a kind of a, my face, I was gonna have like raw meat show up or something. Like <laughs> it's just my face like, hmm? Um, so, that, so when that happens, you'll, you'll be alerted to that. And there's a really big reveal at the end, so pay attention. Why, Gordon, do you believe that a God even exists? Because I was brought up a Christian. I was brought up to believe that. I mean... How long have you had the belief? Since I was uh, able to think. <laughs> and it gets stronger as I grow older. Interesting. Yeah. Yesterday, I ran into a family that had a little four-month-old baby. Uh -huh. And they identified themselves as Christians. But they could have easily been Hindus or Muslims or pagans. Doesn't matter. Well, not, not pagans, but pagans are non-believers. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what, what religion you come from or what your ethnicity is. As long as you believe in a supreme being, uh, you know, whether you call him Allah or God or Nehu or whatever, as long as you believe in the same being, it doesn't matter. Let's say that little girl is raised to believe that there's no God. Well, I feel sorry for her. <laughs> Would she be just as correct in her belief as you being raised with your belief? Just as correct? No, I mean... Why not? Because this was all created for us, for by God, and <clears throat> we look for eternal life. And that comes through salvation. And if you don't believe in God, then you can't have salvation. Are you saying that 
if a child is raised to believe in a God, they're justified in having the belief. But if a child is raised to believe in no gods, they're not just... A young child has no, has no concept of what's right or wrong at, at that point. They believe only what they're told. And so what they, were, what they are taught in the first five years of life will probably be with them for the rest of their life, which is unfortunate. Wow. Okay. So, because I avoided the raw, because I avoided the raw meat of those of those those two exchanges there, where he said that he said pagans are non-believers. Well, that's not true. I could have interrupted him and corrected him, and we could have gone on this different tangent, but I didn't. I just let it go. It's not important, really. And then he said, "I'd feel sorry for the little girl who was raised atheist." That that pisses me off, honestly. <laughs> I have two kids, and I, they're the greatest kids, and and that really has nothing to do with it. But if I went, if I chased those distractions, um, it would have been really unfortunate if I had done that because we wouldn't have had that wonderful discovery at the end. Um, really quickly, it's easy to be angry when you hear stuff like that, okay? Because, let's face it, we were told lies by the people that we love, and it hurts. Um, we have a right to be angry, we really do. And yet most of us found our way out. And I'm hopeful that we can kind of channel that anger into something positive. Try to let those things slide for the benefit of the conversation, for the benefit of the discovery, like I did there with our friend Gordon. All right, I've got one more clip. Gosh, I just have 10 minutes left, huh? I think I'm going to skip this clip. Darn, I, that kills me to do that. Um, it's not in my control, I'm sorry. <laughs> this click, this, this minute, I'm, I'm trying to decide where to go here. All right, let's stop talking about it. I wanna, I'm going to show you one more clip. All right, I talked about the angry atheist. This is Joanna. We're on a trail. She's, she was said that she was 90% confident that God was real. She bumps it up to 100 after like 10 minutes into the talk. This is about 20 minutes into the talk. It's a five-minute chat, and um, I want you to kind of notice the thinker's pose and notice the pacing of this, notice the calm nature of it, notice the respect and the attention and the, the intention of wanting to fully understand what she's saying. If this belief that's in your head mm -hmm. and this 100% certainty that the God exists is based on a foundation of you being raised and taught something, how can you be certain that it's actually true? That's kind of like how we were talking about earlier. <laughs> it is very faith-based. Um, we're going to definitely have to unpack this yeah. faith-based thing. I don't know. I think it, keep... it is pretty broad. Um, what is a faith-based Faith-based is that you can't see him. You can't always hear him. You just have to believe that he'll pull through for your favor. And even if it isn't in your favor, that he'll work into your favor somehow. <laughs> There's a lot of negative things happen in life, but it really depends on which route you take that. Um, but, gosh, how, what's the way to put it, too? I just think it's something that's inside of you as well, which can go along other religions, too, because, like, being out in nature gives you a lot of peace, but when I pray, I have a lot of peace, and I feel like I have more direction, and I pause and reflect more, and... Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, like I said, it's, it's faith. You can never be uh, kind of like you're thinking about that 90%, but I don't know how else to put it. That's hard. I haven't actually talked that out with somebody before fully, so I don't really have words. <laughs> That's fine. Now, can I ask you one more question and we'll sure. wrap it up? Yeah. So my question is, if you couldn't use faith to conclude that your God exists to now the 100% level of confidence, mm -hmm. if a faith-based foundation wasn't an option for you, mm -hmm. where do you think you would be in terms of your confidence that the God existed? 
wouldn't be very high. Because like I said before, he's not really, he's not literally standing in front of us right now, if that makes sense. I mean, Okay. Yeah, you said you can't see him, you can't exactly. hear him. Exactly. Um, a lot of people kind of need concrete things in front of them in order to kind of have that 100% faith, or not faith, faith, sorry, 100% trust in something, especially something that you base your whole life off of. I feel like if you don't have, faith is one of those things where you don't always feel like you're in control, and I feel like as humans we always like to have control. <laughs> and... Um, it's another thing where I kind of everyone kind of strays off of their path, but I always find my way back. So. Okay. Um, yeah. May I ask you one more question? Uh, th this will, I promise this will be the last <laughs> one, unless you say, "Please keep asking mm -hmm. questions." But this is my last one. Sure. In these conversations that I've had with lots of people, regardless of what God they believe in, and regardless of how they were raised. They will often say that I believe it because of faith. I can't see the God, I can't hear the God, but I believe it. And they are believing in completely different deities. Mm -hmm. Wildly different. Yeah. So my last question to you is, is faith a reliable way to come to know something to be true if anyone can use it for anything? <laughs> oh, wow. You got me there. It doesn't change what I believe, but... Actually, I have a lot of religions or a lot of faiths. It's very cool, too. So maybe another way to ask it. I beg your pardon? Is there another way you can ask it? Is there another way I can ask it? Okay. Or is it a question, or is it kind of like an opening? We can certainly end it on that point. And if yeah. you want to, I know you're, you seem like a thinker. Mm -hmm. And if you want to think about it, and we can, you know, I, if I never hear from you again, that's fine. Yeah. But if you want to ping me, I can give you my email address. Yeah. I can rephrase it to leave it with you one more time. Sure. You can yeah. think about it. I'll give you the card. Yeah. So I suppose the final question that you can either answer now or just think about mm -hmm. would be, if anyone can use faith to conclude that anything is true, why on earth would they want to use that method? Well, I really like chatting with you. Yeah, I Okay. I have five minutes, five minutes here, so just really quick. Rich is really quick. Did you notice the pacing of it? Did you notice that it was calm? I was asking questions. I wasn't telling her a damn thing. I was just giving her some of my observations. I was telling a story, like the previous speaker had mentioned, the importance of storytelling. Um, now, this approach is freaking out professional believers. They're worried about it because I think they would rather see us argue, like I did there with street preacher Phil. Uh, it's a lot easier to demonize an atheist when I'm behaving like that as opposed to when I'm having a cordial conversation with somebody like Joanna there. Okay, I've got one more video and we've got like three minutes left. So I'm gonna wrap this up. This one is one and a half minutes long. And I'm showing you this video because uh, this one is so cool. It's this couple, we start talking and this fellow is getting pressure from one, he's a Christian, he's 100% sure. He's getting pressure from one of his friends who's a Jehovah's Witness. And we had, him and I had this wonderful conversation. His wife came up and listened mostly. And he's extolling the virtues of the conversation that he just had where I was using this approach. So here's I'm James. Thinking about anything. I'm not happy email. <laughs> Nothing will make me happier. Okay. That don't, don't put it in I was going to say, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll be watching for it. Yeah, hit me up. I, I'd really like to find out if there's a better way to conclude that this God exists other than the reasons that you gave me. Mm -hmm. Do you find that? The reasons that you've explained to me very great, know, you know, very that's well. Good, that's a good question for my buddy. That's a good question for him. Why? Why? Because he's he's so strong in his beliefs. Mm. You know, my buddy Gilbert. He's so strong in his belief. I'm asking, hey, Gilbert, is there? How sure are you? How you know? 
And I'm going to see what his question I think his answer is going to be similar to what I just gave you, but I'm going to ask him. You know, I think it would be really cool is if you were to learn about street epistemology, watch a couple of my videos, and then engage with your you friend. You got videos on their website? Yeah, okay. yeah. If you, if you email me, I'll send you the link to my channel. Okay. And uh, you can check them out. All right. Thank you so much. Anthony, really, nice really you, enjoyed it. Anthony. Lovely right. talk. Thank you. Bye. I got me thinking now. I got <laughs> <laughs> James. If you'd like to learn how to do that, we get into a lot more detail. Uh, we had a workshop yesterday. The organizers here were kind enough to schedule another one for tomorrow at noon in that, is it Nakatachi or there's, there's a room, just, you'll, you'll find it. So it's at noon tomorrow. Um, we are tabling as well. And just to wrap this up, I've got two minutes. Let me just wrap it up. Um, I do think that this method is changing the way atheists interact with believers. And it's harder for believers to say, don't talk to that person because she's asking hard questions. If you have the truth, it should stand up to the scrutiny of some, some simple questions. And you notice in that video how James was picking up that, it, oh, I didn't ask him how. How, is he, how did he figure out that that's true? So uh, he, he was getting it there at the end. And I really do think that when the history books are written, on the success of atheism in America, that there will be chapters on street epistemology. So my, my question to you is, are you willing and able to help us make that happen? Thank you very much.